Good morning. Welcome again. This is Pastor David as we continue through the names of God, looking at specifically the Hebrew names of God as mentioned in the scriptures. And we are going to delve in again today, uh, looking at one that comes up in Leviticus chapter 20. This is actually mentioned, this name is mentioned twice in scripture, one in Exodus and one in Leviticus. But I want to re really pull out this one because of the book of Leviticus and its connection really to the meaning behind this, this name. So as we delve in, we're looking at Leviticus chapter 20, verse 8. And it comes down to this scripture and it says, God telling us in verse 8, You shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And if we go on into and dive right into our uh, interlinear, we can see kind of a little bit of what he's talking about. Now, I want to point out a couple of things before we get into the actual name of God. In verse 8, you'll notice that he has commandments, basically, placed in here in reference to the people. And so he says, you shall keep my statutes and perform them. And he's using the second masculine plural in talking to the people. Uh, and I, we talked about this before, how it's not necessarily, this isn't an instance of God talking only to men. This is an instance of God talking to everyone and that plural even though it is listed as masculine, is not only focused at masculine people. It's just a, a, the way that the Hebrew uses those verb tenses. So when he looks in this, we have basically a break in this scripture where he tells us things to do, keep my statutes and perform them, where he is saying, you guys do those things. Then he goes and we have kind of a similar format that we have seen before where he refers to himself in the first person he says i the lord or i am yah i am the lord who sanctifies you and in this we would actually pronounce this a little bit different a lot of times when you see it in in uh in study if you're looking it up online or something like that you'll see something like this, Jehovah Mekadesh. Now, Jehovah Mekadesh is the same basic thing, but it's written a little bit differently within the scripture. And we have this word right here, and we have the name pronounced, the way that it would be pronounced in this instance is Yah Mekadesh Kem. Now, the significance that we have pulled out in a couple of instances before is that he is putting a suffix on the end. He's using a second masculine plural suffix. So he is basically saying that he's the God that sanctifies you all, everybody that he's referring to, and anybody coming afterwards that reads this scripture, he's referring to everyone he's using that second masculine plural suffix now another interesting thing about this and we haven't gotten into verb tenses uh, an awful lot in this but i do want to delve into it a little bit because we've talked before about the perfect and the imperfect those are really the two main tenses that you see in hebrew there's Several others, but those are the two main. And I will put it up here again, just so that we know. We have the perfect and the imperfect. The perfect denotes a complete action. This is something that has, uh, we might consider it our past tense, but it's not necessarily a past tense. 
It's something that's completed. And there are instances in the scripture where God refers to things that hasn't happened yet, but he uses the perfect tense. And it's awesome if you think about it because in God's reality, in the way that it, beyond us, it's already complete. Now, when we get into the imperfect, we are talking about an incomplete. Now, this the it's use, the use of incomplete within the scriptures or the um, imperfect tense is significant. Also, um, imperfect denotes a a an act that is not complete. So it's an act that's ongoing. In that way, while perfect might be considered a past tense, even though that's not technically correct, um, the imperfect really goes beyond our temporal uh, view of, of tense. Because imperfect kind of super, uh, supersedes all of them. If you, do, if you use the imperfect, and, and it, I'll give you an example. The, the scripture says that God breathed into man the breath of life in Genesis. Now, we actually use that in a past tense. So some might think that it's written in the perfect, but it isn't. It's actually written in the imperfect. So when we look at that scripture, it quite literally could be translated, God breathed, is breathing, and will breathe into man the breath of life. It's a continual aspect that's, that was basically started with Adam and has not come to completion. It hasn't come to complete fruition. So these are significant and used throughout Scripture. But here, we're actually looking at, if we go back to our interlinear, we're looking at the PL tense. Now, this, when we start talking about PL, this is verbal. And so this would be an action. This is something that is, that is taking place. So when we think about it, it makes sense. God sanctifies it's it's more akin to like uh see bob run or see bob throw it's that action taking place it's it's verbal in that in that concept but it's not used as a verb it's actually used as a participle within hebrew which, if we were to look at it, comparatively speaking, that would be more akin to an adjective. So what we have in this instance is a verbal adjective. It's a descriptive verb used in reference to God. Now, I can give you an example of that because we understand the concept of loving an individual. So if we were to talk about, say, a man and say, this man loves so-and-so, that is a word being used as a verb. But if we refer to the man as a loving man, then you have a verbal adjective because the description, the verb is used as a descriptor in reference to the man. He's not just a man who loves something specifically. He is a loving man. Now, in this instance, what we have here is not that God sanctifies and is doing an act of sanctification. We actually have that God is the sanctifier. He's, a, he's the sanctifying God. So 
if we look at this from that concept, from that perspective, we actually note some things that are very specific because we have, again, this separation of us performing action and God performing action. The separation being God is saying, do these things because I'm a sanctifying God and I'm your sanctifying God. Now, that means that our acts on this side are separate. They are literally, well, let me, let me put it this way. You performing the acts of God isn't what sanctifies you. You do these things, God is telling you, he's saying, look, keep my statutes. Do these things I'm telling you to do because I am your sanctifying God. I am the God who sanctifies. There is no sanctification. This is what this is demonstrating. There is no sanctification apart from God. All sanctification comes from him because he is the sanctifying God. So our acts do not bring sanctification. This is very important because a lot of times we get into legalism within Christianity. And we start believing that if we do certain things, that we will be justified in the eyes of God. We, we look at action as indicative of our place, our connection. And, and we run into a lot of this within Scripture and, and a lot of it within other denominations even, where they start looking at all of these legalistic terms and, and all of these legalistic ideals of things that you have to do in order to be saved. Actions that you have to take. At one point, if you didn't wear your hair in a bun, then you were not saved. If you didn't wear a, a dress that went all the way down to your ankles, if, and, and for other religions, if you don't cover all of your skin, if you don't do this, if, if you eat that, or if you do this other thing, then you are not saved. And we have to, in those instances, basically work towards being saved. Our works then become a justification. In this instance, it actually demonstrates that our works are not a justification. They are not a sanctifying act. God is saying, do these works because I'm telling you to do them and I am your sanctifier. Now, this word uh, comes from the root word. These first, or In fact, you actually see it right here, these three letters. That's your root word, Kadesh. The root word here that we translate sanctification is, is really a cleansing and a purification. So it's a cleansing and purification, but it's also a setting apart. That God basically saying, this I have set aside as holy unto me. I have made this a holy vessel a vessel of honor. And because I have made you, and because I am the one that sets you apart as a vessel of honor, you should do these things that I am telling you to do. So, as we look at this, we, we see this great instance in which God is basically saying, <clears throat> I am your sanctifier. And he's, he's using it as a descriptive word, a verbal description of who he is in regards to us. Now, I actually want to uh, pause for just a second so I can wipe this board off. And then we're going to come back. I want to pull out a couple of scripture passages 
so that we can then uh, take a look at what that kind of looks like in reference to us as the followers of God. All right, so now that you are back with us, I wanted to show you a couple of verses that kind of delve into this. And one of the reasons I went to the book of Leviticus for this name of God. A lot of times we as Christians, we kind of overlook Leviticus. We overlook um, numbers, um, even sometimes Deuteronomy, because Deuteronomy can be kind of a, a rehash of a lot of stuff that happened earlier. But I really want us as, as believers to begin to realize that there's, a, that there's a reason God put the scriptures together the way that he did. There's a reason that the Holy Spirit moved upon and inspired holy men of, of God to write down these words. And there's stuff in the scriptures that we gloss over that we don't even pay attention to because we don't think that it's significant. And yet, I am a firm believer, and, and I believe that this is demonstrated within Scripture and it is typically held by all of us, but we don't look at it from this perspective. But I am a firm believer that God is perfect, and if God is perfect, God does everything perfectly. Everything is in order. Everything is in, with reason. Everything is set together for a particular reason. God doesn't make uh, accidents. He doesn't uh, have mistakes. He doesn't put stuff in that's not supposed to be there. There's a reason. And so when we go into Leviticus chapter 6, verse 28 and 30, we have a passage that we see similarities in other uh, parts of Leviticus. But here, he's talking about the sin offering. And he's talking about preparing the sin offering and what you do with the vessels after you prepare the sin offering. And here in Leviticus chapter 6, verse 28, and reading through 30, it says, Also the earthenware vessel in which it was boiled shall be broken. And if it was boiled in a bronze vessel, then it shall be scoured and rinsed in water. Every male among the priests may eat of it. It is most holy. But no sin offering of which any of the blood is brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burned with fire. Now, the thing I want us to look at in this instance is the vessels. There are two types of vessels mentioned. You have your earthen vessel and you have your bronze vessel. Now, did you notice the difference between the two? If you use an earthen vessel, it's supposed to be broken. But if you use a bronze vessel, it can be scoured and rinsed. Now, there are several passages in Scripture that talk about cleansing vessels and what you are to do in order to cleanse specific vessels. If they are defiled, if something happens to them. And... One thing that you'll note, in every instance, it will talk about earthen vessels being broken. But other vessels, it will mention, like bronze, and in another place it mentions a wooden vessel. Those can be rinsed or scoured. Now the significance that we miss is this. A bronze vessel... It, again, not to be too simplistic, but I don't want to um, I don't want to just assume that we all understand this. A bronze vessel is made of brass that has uh, some other little uh, metals in it. Now, the good thing about that is you have a metal dish. And so if something happens to it, if it gets dirty, any, if any of you have like a stainless steel pot at home, you know that if you have one of these metal dishes and something gets in it, something uh, bad or something, say you left dinner accidentally sitting in it for a week, you had to run out of the, I don't know why, but for some reason you had to run out of the house and huge 
thing happened. You can't come back. You got a stainless steel pot. Well, you don't have to throw it away, right? You can dump it out and then you can scour the inside of the pot and clean the pot. You can get rid of all of that stuff because it doesn't seep into the metal. It sits on the surface of the metal. So when you scour it, you basically clean off the surface. The problem with an earthen vessel is earthen vessels are porous. So if you have something in an earthen vessel and it goes bad, it seeps into the vessel. It actually gets pulled into the the main point, the main part of the of the earthen vessel. And so no matter how much you clean an earthen vessel, you cannot get it out. So it has to be broken. Now, if you think about it, the, the Bible demonstrates that we were created out of the dust of the ground, and the Bible consistently refers to us as earthen vessels. And if we go down um, and to our second passage, I want to read this. This is an uh, instance in Genesis 6 where God looks down at man. And it says, And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You see, when man sinned, man became defiled by sin. But sin didn't defile the outward part of man. It seeped in and it defiled our heart. It defiled our mind. It separated us from God and made us basically to where we were defiled and not capable of being in the presence of God. Now, if we go back to our vessels, we look at our vessels. Well, what do you do with a vessel that has been defiled? Well, if it doesn't seep inside and affect the inner parts of the vessel, you can clean it. But if it seeps inside, if it's porous and it takes that defilement within, then it has to be broken. A lot of times people forget and they don't understand that because we sinned, sin entered into our hearts and into our minds and it defiled us to our core. And because of that, we were in need of being broken and cast out. Broken, destroyed, and cast away. A lot of people get upset about that, but the reality is that is what's necessary. That is the only thing you can do to cleanse us from our defilement. Now, the, the great and awesome thing is God, knowing that we were defiled to our core, did the impossible. He literally cleansed the uncleansable item. He took an earthen vessel like us that was sin, that had uh, been defiled by sin to its core. And he said, I am setting it apart and I am cleansing it. That's why he tells us to keep his statutes and to perform what he says and he is the sanctifier because he is cleansing, purifying, and setting apart us back for him. He's, he's setting us apart from the world and basically doing a complete reversal of what we did. And the significance again is we could not do it for ourselves. We did not have the ability if you are defiled, you cannot cleanse yourself. In fact, if you look at it again from the concept of an earthen vessel, the earthen vessel has no ability to cleanse itself. It's defiled. It has to be cleansed from an outward source. And in this instance, it has to be cleansed 
by somebody who is already cleansed and able to clean the the item. So we can't cleanse ourselves from the sin that has invaded us as human beings. We can't sit there and go, oh, well, I started living right and I started doing this and I started giving to the poor and I started taking and helping old ladies cross the street and I started, you know, given to the local food bank and, and I don't hurt anybody and I don't kill anybody and, and I don't commit any murder. And, uh, you know, I might sometimes tell a white lie, but it, at heart, I'm a good person. No, that is emphatically false. You are at your core, a sinful being worthy only of destruction, but God is is the sanctifier and he is able to sanctify you to set you apart from all the other defiled vessels to pull you out of that so that one day we can be with him in eternity forever it's a great and mighty thing that we don't even understand we don't realize how we we just we don't realize how impossible the task of bringing us back was. We don't realize how, how impossible it was for man to be saved. And when Jesus is trying to tell people later on in the scriptures and to get them to understand and fathom, and he says things like, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. And the people start going, oh my goodness, then who can be saved? And Jesus goes, but with God, all things are possible. You see, we, we look at that passage sometimes and we think that it's just in reference to, to rich people, but really it's in reference to the impossibility of salvation that, that God is did the impossible he saved us that is the greatest miracle in all of creation that was the single solitary most significant miracle in all creation because it doesn't matter if god heals every single human being on this planet if he if he heals their body if he heals their mind if we all walked in perfect health if he didn't save our soul, sanctify us, and set us apart for his purpose, then none of that would be important. None of that would mean anything because ultimately we would still die and we would still go to hell for all of eternity. And see, when you get right down to it, how arrogant is it to reject that gift and say, I don't need you. I'm all right by myself. When God literally moved mountains and, and sacrificed himself on the cross. Kind of makes you feel a little bit silly about some of the things we pray for, doesn't it? Because the reality is, God is an amazing and awesome God. And salvation is impossible. The impossible made possible. I sincerely hope and pray that God... Uh, is with you in this coming week and that you have a, a great time and that this kind of uh, stirs in your spirit and in your heart and that God is uh, continually in your thoughts and prayers. Thank you.